Trust the only payment solution developed for attorneys and recommended by 47 state bars, LawPay. Hi, I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, a senior writer with the ABA Journal. In the more than 20 years I've spent talking to well-known attorneys who love their work, I've learned that many have great advice on matters both in and outside the law. And sometimes I'll ask them about things they know now that they wish they had known when starting their careers. I want to share some of that advice with listeners. So we created a special series, Asked and Answered, Lived and Learned. In this episode, I'm speaking with Cruz Reynoso, a former California Supreme Court justice and law professor. He began his legal career in El Centro, California, and was active with the Community Service Organization, a grassroots Mexican-American group whose members included Edward Royball, Cesar Chavez, and Dolores Huerta. Welcome to the show, Justice Reynoso. Thank you so much. Yes. What I wanted to ask you about first off is I watched a speech you gave a few years ago and you mentioned working in El Centro, which for listeners, that's near the California-Mexico border in Imperial County. It was in the early 1960s. And sometimes you would see a lack of communication between people in the civil rights movement and Anglos in Imperial County who wanted things to stay the way they'd always been. I was curious, in dealing with groups then who were opposed to what the CSO was doing, largely because of race, what did you learn then that you think could be applied to what's going on in the country today? Well, it seems to me that any of the groups like the CSO in those days has to be sure that it represents the best interests of its membership and the people that it represents. The CSO basically represented the Mexican-American people. And then be polite but forceful in bringing to the community at large, be they government officials or others, the needs of that community. And realize that sometimes those in authority haven't done the right thing simply because the issue has not been brought to them. And when brought to them properly, very often the public officials will actually respond affirmatively to the needs of the membership of the CSO and other poor people in the community. Your Honor, I want to pick up on something you said. You mentioned being polite but forceful. Can you expand on that for us a bit? Well, that's right. Very often you don't need to have a rally of protest or even signs of protest. That is, if you simply bring the issues to the proper authorities, one must not assume that they will not listen. And so bring those issues to those public authorities and see what happens. I'm curious, did you have instances where some of your colleagues assumed that they wouldn't be heard and you had to convince them, well, we will be if we do it in this way. And if that happened, can you tell me a bit about it? Well, that's not unusual because very often one will be dealing with individuals and groups who have been concerned about a certain issue that to them seems obvious. Thus, for example, when I was living in Imperial County in El Centro, The east side of El Centro did not have sidewalks, which the people there wanted. That, to many people, would be obvious that a community would want sidewalks. Nonetheless, that default in what the city was doing needed to be brought to the authorities politely but forcefully. And eventually, the authorities agreed with the people in the minority community in El Centro to, in fact, do what needed to be done to bring sidewalks to that community. Interesting. I also wanted to chat a bit of your time when you were director of the California Rural Legal Assistance, and then in 1970, then Governor Ronald Reagan vetoed your funding. I read an op-ed piece you wrote a few years ago saying that, you know, this wasn't a surprise. and Many of his donors were significant corporate farm growers. Yes, And that, you know, to move to take away your funding, that stripped poor people of their economic, political, legal, and social bargaining power. I'm curious, for someone who's doing public interest work today, representing people who are in poverty, and they think that their state or federal budget cuts are due to business interests, what advice do you have in terms of helping perhaps the general public see that, you know, this isn't because people need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps? 
this has to do with big business and lobbying. It seems to me that a community is better off having everybody in that community do well, that even those who are wealthy will be happier if everybody in the community is doing well. So it seems to me that it's of interest to those who may be wealthy or may have political influence to do what they can to help those who are poorer or who do not have the political know-how in bringing about a better community. Because the studies all indicate that even those who are at the upper echelons economically will be happier themselves and the community will be happier if everybody in the community is profiting. So it's a long way of saying that those who have influence and money are themselves better off if everybody in the community is better off. And did you see, during the time when you started, did you see California come to agree with that outlook overall? And if so, how did it happen? How did it build and grow? I assume it built and grew through the experience showing that, in fact, that approach did work and that, in fact, those who had the political power or economic power were themselves better off to make sure that everybody in the community was able to live well and profit in that community. We're going to take a quick break. And when will we come back, we're going to discuss a parenting outlook that I've been told you had, that your kids have attributed to you. And it has to do with work. Did you know that attorneys who accept online payments get paid 39% faster on average than those using traditional payment methods? With LawPay, the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program, you can accept client payments online, via email, or in person, no equipment needed. Visit lawpay.com slash podcast to sign up and get your first three months free. And we're back. I'm Stephanie Francis Warren, and you're listening to a special edition of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, which focuses on professional and personal advice from experienced lawyers. My guest today is Justice Cruz Reynoso, who was the first Latino lawyer with California Rural Legal Assistance, a nonprofit group that serves migrant workers and their rural poor. Your Honor, in a film I was watching about your life, many of your children were saying that one of the things you taught them growing up is that whatever job or task you have, to do it with dignity. I think for there's many jobs that we have throughout our lives that we don't like, and that's probably true for kids too, especially with chores you give them. How did you install the importance of them, of doing your work with dignity, and how did you learn that yourself? Well, I don't know that I learned it myself. I think I learned it from my father, mm. who was himself mostly a farm worker, but his philosophy was that whatever you do, you need to do it well. If it requires that you be in the field at five in the morning, you should be there at five in the morning. You should be respectful of the work that you're doing because after all, it really is important. Thus, for example, when I was a youngster, we picked oranges and my father would comment on the fact that by that, we were helping to feed the citizens, the residents of California, of the US and the world. So it seems like a very small thing to do to be picking oranges in Orange County in Southern California, but in fact it has a stronger manifestation in terms of what it's doing for the state, for the country, and for the world. I see. And I think I saw somewhere that today you have a hobby farm. Is that correct? Well, we have a small ranch. Let's put it that way. (laughs) Okay. I'm curious, growing up in a family that did farm work and having a small ranch today, Are there things you've learned from working with the land and animals that you think have helped you as an attorney? I think it has helped me as a human being and helped me as an attorney. Because when you have animals, for example, and they need to be fed, they need to be fed at a certain time. So it teaches you an element of responsibility. That translates to the role that a lawyer has in representing other people and the high responsibility that that lawyer has. Or in being a judge, the responsibility that a judge has to study the cases and to be fair in his or her decision. So I think, though they seem quite separate, in fact, they're quite related in terms of how 
a human being needs to respond to those obligations. All right. And Your Honor, that's everything we have time today. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're more than welcomed. And listeners, thank you for joining us. If you like what you heard today, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and check out our other special edition Lived and Learned podcasts in the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered series.